Chris and just thank everyone for being here tonight. We appreciate you um, taking time away from your busy summer to join us. I'm very excited to have Becky Espinel here, registered dietitian, going to talk to us more about the Mind Diet. Um, for those that are not familiar with this format, you are welcome to um, ask questions in the Q and A box. It is a webinar format, so. It's not currently set up to ask questions directly, but if you like, you can always raise your hand and we can try it um, at the end of the webinar if you prefer to ask that way. But the Q&A or the chat box are both great options. If you wanna ask a question, I'm happy to ask it on your behalf. And with that, Becky, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thanks so much. Okay, perfect. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, I don't know if you can see me though. I'm not sure if the camera is working, but. I believe, um, I know I can see you, but if, if oh, you're not okay. able to see Becky, let me know and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll change it around. Okay. As you can tell, I'm not tech savvy. So, <laughs> um, so a little bit about me, I have, have been a dietitian at Barton hospital for about 10 years now. Um, before that I worked as a unit clerk and a diet aide. Um, I left in my internship at South Texas and then came back and then working as a dietitian here at Barton, I've had the privilege of working in acute care and the long-term care facility. Um, and in both of those areas, I have been able to work with patients and families that have dementia. Um, and I'm assuming that most people that are probably listening tonight, maybe you have a loved one that has dementia or you have lost someone that had dementia, or maybe you've recently been diagnosed. So I'm sure it touches to home. Um, but there is hope for people. Um, it's not, they do say that it could be um, genetically related or, um, but there's no exact link to dementia. Um, so Tonight, what we're going to focus on is the MIND diet. It's a preventative measure to decrease your risk of getting in, getting dementia. Um, the research suggests that the MIND diet may reduce incidence of brain disease that increases a person's risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. The diet is mostly plant-based, but there is um, inclusion, inclusion of fish and poultry. Um, it's lower in red meat, sweets, and low in saturated fat. Now what the MIND diet stands for is Mediterranean DASH intervention for neurodegenerative delay. And DASH is an acronym for dietary approaches to stop, uh, to stop hypertension. So there's a lot to cover, so we better get started. Um, tonight, what we're gonna talk about is the definition of Alzheimer's. You are gonna know the definition and origin of the MIND diet. You'll know your MIND diet score and what foods you should eat and what foods you should limit. Um, the reason why I'm focusing on Alzheimer's, there is other dementias, but the reason why I focus on Alzheimer's is because that's really what Dr. Morris uses in her book. She talks a lot about Alzheimer's disease. Um, dementia is a general term for decline in mental abilities that is severe enough to interfere with daily life. There's a number of different types of dementia, but the primary ones are Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, and Lewy body dementia. Um, they are mostly distinguished by the, the pathology found in the brain. So with that, we will talk about dementia, just uh, Alzheimer's disease. Just some quick facts. It affects over 50 million people worldwide. Most people that suffer from Alzheimer's are 65 years and older, but there, er, there is early onset dementia, which can start as young as 30. Um, people, uh, Alzheimer's accounts for 60 to 80% of dementia cases. And on average, a person who's diagnosed with Alzheimer's can live four to eight years after diagnosis, but they can also live very long lives of up to 20 years. But if you think about it, if you're diagnosed at 30 and you're living 20, that's not that long of a life. Um, so what is it? It is Alzheimer's disease is a brain disorder that slowly destroys memory and thinking skills and eventually the ability to carry out the simplest tasks. There are two abnormal structures um, called plaques and tangles. They're the prime suspects in damaging and killing the nerve cells in the brain. The plaques are uh, deposits of protein fragments called beta amyloid that build up in the spaces between the nerve cells. Uh, 
the tangles are twisted fibers of another protein called tau that build up inside of the cells. Though autopsy studies show that most people do develop some plaques and tangles as they age, those with Alzheimer's develop far more in a more predictable pattern. And you can see that in that picture of the brain with the little blue dot there. You can see where it starts right there in the hippocampus and then it starts to spread around. Um, where it really starts to affect is memory at the beginning. And these are short-term memory thoughts like, what did I do a couple hours ago? What did I do two days ago? And so that's where it originates from. And then scientists, they don't really know the exact role of the plaques and tangles that they play in Alzheimer's disease, but extra experts do believe that somehow they play a critical role in blocking the communication among the nerve cells and disrupting the process that the cells need to survive. So you can see in that one picture of the healthy brain and then the severe Alzheimer's brain, the Alzheimer's brain is shrunken down and that's because of the nerve cells dying. It's the destruction and the death of the nerve cells that cause memory failure, personality changes, problems carrying out uh, activities of daily living. And activities of daily living are just as simple as getting yourself to go to the bathroom independently being able to brush your hair, being able to brush your teeth, being able to feed yourself is a big concern. Um, so right now, what I'm gonna do is play a video, um, if I can get it to work. It's a very, very short video. It's not long at all. It's only three minutes long, and it's from aboutalzheimers.org, and it really hits home. You can, instead of having someone talk about it, you can get a really nice visual of seeing the effects of Alzheimer's. So what is Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's is a slow, fatal disease of the brain affecting 1 in 10 people over the age of 65. No one is immune. The disease comes on gradually as two abnormal protein fragments called plaques and tangles accumulate in the brain and kill brain cells. They start here in the hippocampus, the part of the brain where memories are first formed. Over many years time, the plaques and tangles slowly destroy the hippocampus and it becomes harder and harder to form new memories. Simple recollections from a few hours or days ago that the rest of us might take for granted are just not there. After that, more plaques and tangles spread into different regions of the brain, killing cells and compromising function wherever they go. This spreading around is what causes the different stages of Alzheimer's. From the hippocampus, the disease spreads here to the region of the brain where language is processed. When that happens, it gets tougher and tougher to find the right word. Next, the disease creeps toward the front of the brain where logical thought takes place. Very gradually, a person begins to lose the ability to solve problems, grasp concepts, and make plans. Next, the plaques and tangles invade the part of the brain where emotions are regulated. When this happens, the patient gradually loses control over moods and feelings. After that, the disease moves to where the brain makes sense of things it sees, hears, and smells. In this stage, Alzheimer's wreaks havoc on a person's senses and can spark hallucinations. Eventually, the plaques and tangles erase a person's oldest and most precious memories, which are stored here in the back of the brain. Near the end, the disease compromises a person's balance and coordination. And in the very last stage, it destroys the part of the brain that regulates breathing and the heart. The progression from mild forgetting to death is slow and steady and takes place over an average of eight to 10 years. It is relentless and for now, incurable. Helping your family, friends and neighbors to better understand Alzheimer's will reduce stigma, improve care and even help the fight for a cure. Thanks for helping to do your part. So in that video, 
Um, I appreciate the fact that they said that there was no cure. So there is still no cure, but what we can do is um, we can do preventative measures so we don't get Alzheimer's. Now it's just decreasing your risk. There's no guarantee, but to do lifestyle changes and modifications can make a big impact. Um, research has found that older adults may benefit from mind, the mind diet, even if they've already had these protein deposits found. Um, so what is the mind diet? Where did it originate from? The mind diet originated uh, at Chicago's Rush University Medical Center by Martha Claire Morris. She's a nutritional epidemiologist, Dr. Frank Sachs, and the research team. Uh, Dr. Sachs was one of the originators of the DASH diet. Um, what Dr. Morris did, she was the principal investigator in two large population-based studies for the development of Alzheimer's disease and cognitive decline and um, other common problems in older people. One of the studies was called the Chicago Health and Aging Project, or CHAP, which began in 1995 and included more than 10,000 residents aged 65 and older living in the south side of Chicago. The participants were evaluated every three years for health and lifestyle uh, and behavior changes. The neurological evaluations for the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and other dementia were also performed, but on a smaller scale and on randomly sub selected participants. The second study that she was um, a part of was called the Memory and Aging Project, or MAP, which included more than 1,800 residents living in retirement communities and senior public housings throughout uh, the Chicago metropolitan area. The participants of the MAP study were evaluated annually for neurological conditions, cognitive abilities, and diet. Um, and they all agreed to donate their brains after they died. Both of the studies were funded by the National Institute of Health and the Alzheimer's Association. Um, and these two studies were instrumental in developing the MIND diet. From those studies, oops, there we go. From those studies, uh, from the CHAP study and the MAP study, um, they determined that participants had a lower risk of Alzheimer's disease and slower rate of cognitive decline with dietary intake of vitamin E, vitamin B12, folate and niacin, lutidine, beta carotene and flavonoids, seafood and omega-3 fatty acids, and dietary fat consumption that was lower in saturated fats and trans fats and higher in vegetable fats. Um, dietary fats are important because we have fat solub soluble vitamins that we need fat for, and also dietary fat are incorporated into the membranes of neurons or nerve cells, and the type of fat determines how well neurons transmit signals to other nerve cells in the brain. Omega-3 fatty acid, DHA, um, which comes from fish and uh, walnuts, DHA is part of the neuron's surrounding membrane. It makes the neuron flexible and dynamic this improves neurotransmission, which in turn impacts your ability to think more clearly and quickly. Um, also folate, which helps build uh, DHA in new cells, and a powerful antioxidant, vitamin E, which protects against oxidative injuries. The reason why I emphasize dietary intake and not supplements is because supplements are not regulated and there could be depending on the supplement, it may not metabolize how if you were to eat the actual food product. Um, so it can metabolize differently and it might not be as effective. So what the research was for the MIND diet where they developed this was, their method was they developed a MIND diet score that incorporates dietary components, the the food from the DASH and the Mediterranean diet that showed neuroprotective um, abilities and related it to change in cognition over about four and a half years uh, among 923 participants of the Memory and Aging Project. What the results were that the MIND score was positively associated with slower deca decline in global cognitive scores and with each of the five cognitive domains. And the cognitive domains are episodic memory, working memory, semantic memory, visuospatial ability, and perceptual speed. 
Um, in conclusion, it suggests that the MIND diet substantially slows cognitive decline with age. Um, just to make note of the MIND diet score, the score ranged from zero to lowest adherence to 15, the highest adherence. Um, and the, the participants that uh, were in the MAP project, MAP study, they were just over 12 and they still showed benefit of uh, following the MIND diet. The participants in the research study were free of dementia, ages 58 to 98. They all agreed to clinical evaluations and organ donation after death. And they would, the participants would complete a food frequency questionnaire after their clinical evaluation. And it was a, a yearly evaluation. The uh, clinical evaluations included cognitive testing. The technicians that did the testing were trained and certified according to the standardized neuropsychological testing methods. And they, they would administer 21 tests, 19 of which summarized cognition and five of the cognitive domains that we just talked about. What the results were was that the MIND diet lowered the risk of Alzheimer's by as much as 53% in participants who adhered to the diet rigorously and 35% in those who followed it moderately well. I will make note that the MIND diet participants with the highest MIND diet scores tended to have more favorable risk profiles for preserving their cognitive ability, including higher education, greater participation in cognitive cognitive and physical activities, and a lower prevalence for cardiovascular conditions. The higher the MIND diet score, the better the participants would perform over time on all the cognitive tests. And the participants who ranked the top third score of the scores had a rate of cognitive decline that was equivalent to seven and a half years younger. That's amazing. Um, and this graph, I just, it really sums up exactly what we just talked about, that the participants that did not fall, had a very low mind diet score, had a faster cognitive decline than those compared to having a medium mind diet score or even a high diet score, a high mind diet score. Hey, hey Becky. Yes. Um, I don't, I feel like the, um, some of the graphics might not be advancing. I don't know if you had a graphic for this particular slide. Oh, yes, I did. I'm looking right at it. For some reason, I don't know that it's showing up, but that's all right. Um, uh, that's okay. That might did. I hope the video went across. <laughs> the video was great. Yeah. Okay, that's good. good. Um, it's okay. It just shows the line, uh, a line graph of showing the mind diet score having a faster cognitive decline than both the moderate and the rigor, the people that followed the mind diet more rigorously. So it was just exactly what we talked about, but it's just a visual. So it was all right. If you guys didn't get to see it, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but what, what is, what the mind diet is, it's a hybrid of the Mediterranean and the DASH diets. And I, like I said before, the DASH diet is an acronym for dietary approaches to stop hypertension. Um, the MIND approach incorporates foods from both of those diets, the Mediterranean and the DASH diet, that all that had, had scientifically beneficial effect for brain health. There are some differences between the MIND diet, the DASH diet, and the Mediterranean diet. One of the differences is that the MIND diet does recommend two or more vegetables per day, one of which is a green leafy. Another uh, difference is that in the DASH and the Mediterranean diet, they recommend um, eating any kind, uh, three or more servings of fruit, any kind of fruit, whereas the MIND diet really focuses on berries. And honestly, there is a lot of research out there on strawberries and blueberries, if anyone ever has interest in that. Um, another healthy food component of the MIND diet is fish where the Mediterranean diet recommends eating at six or more servings uh, a week, whereas um, the MIND diet recommends eating it once a week is all, and you still get the benefits. Um, the DASH diet emphasizes dairy, whereas the MIND diet is really not specific on it. So the foods that are on the MIND diet are, um, there is 15 different food groups 
10 of which are the healthy food groups and five of which are considered the brainless food groups as she refers to it in the book. Um, the 10 healthy food groups she mentions are green leafy vegetables and you will need at least six servings a week. Um, other vegetables and you would want at least one serving a day. Berries, at least two servings a week. Whole grains, at least three servings a day. Um, fish, one serving a week. Poultry, two servings a week. Beans, um, at least three servings a week. Uh, nuts, five or more servings a week. Wine, one glass of five ounce glass of wine is recommended every day. If you have any sort of addiction problems, if you can't stop after one glass, it is not recommended to, to start drinking. Um, actually, you'll see an adverse effect if you drink more than one glass of wine. So if you do have any issues with that, I suggest you just drink grape juice and you'll still get some benefit. And also olive oil should be your primary source of oil. Um, the MIND diet does suggest limiting. These are considered the brainless foods. Red meat, sweets, uh, whole fat cheese, butter and margarine, and fast and fried foods. Hey, Becky, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, no, no, you're fine. It looks like it's not, the visuals are not showing up. I wonder if you escape out again. Oh, okay. The I'm last sorry. time you did that, the, um, there you go. Oh, you don't you know, know what? I'll just leave it like this. Yeah, I don't know why that's not working. I'm sorry, but I know. Oh, no, no problem. I know all. the images really help. So I want to. Oh, definitely. Sure. Then, yeah. since you can see it, I'll show you guys that graph that we were talking about. Great. Right. Um, perfect. Thank you for letting me know that. Um, so, this is the graph that I was talking about, about the mind score showing um, more cognitive decline with lower adherence than compared to the other two groups if you followed it moderately or if you had a very high mind diet score. And then this is the other visual, which I really like, and I'm sorry you didn't get to see it until now. <laughs> um, and it just breaks down the different food groups that we were just talking about. So right now, what I'm gonna encourage you all to go do is we are gonna determine our mind diet score. So what I'm gonna encourage you all to go do is get a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen, and I am going to go through each food category and you're gonna write, determine your own mind diet score. And then you'll know what areas you need to work on and what areas you're doing so well in. But one thing I will say is that if anyone scores a 15, that's a perfect score. But if you score a 15, there is always room for improvement. We can always do better, I think. Um, so I'll give you guys like 30 seconds to go and get your paper and pencil. Okay. I can't see anyone's faces, so I'm going to assume that we're all back. <laughs> um, so what I'll do is I'll read off the, the, the food group. And then uh, I will say what a serving is, and then you can, and then I'll let you know what the point system is. And then you're gonna write down what point you're, what point you earn for this, okay? So um, green leafy vegetables, a serving of green leafy vegetables is one cup of raw green leafy green, of raw leafy greens, or a half a cup cooked. And it could be anything from arugula, colored greens, kale, mustard greens, romaine lettuce, spinach, or Swiss chard. Anything that you can think of that's a leafy green. Now, if you eat six or more servings a week, give yourself one point. If you eat more than two, but less than six servings a week, give yourself a half a point. And if you eat two or less servings a week, give yourself zero points. And really think about it, like, do you eat a salad at lunch? It's not just dinner time that we're focusing on, it's every meal that you eat throughout the day. So other vegetables, same deal with the other vegetables. It's a one cup of raw or half cup cooked, 
is considered a serving and other vegetables. I'm going to list off a lot and maybe it'll trigger something. Um, if you eat asparagus, beets, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, carrots, cauliflower, peas, radish, squash, sweet potatoes, yam, zucchini, anything you can think of that wasn't a green leafy, you can count it as an other vegetable. Um, so if you eat one or more servings a day, give yourself one point. If you eat five, but less than seven servings um, a week, give yourself a half a point. And if you eat less than five servings a week, give yourself zero points. Okay, for berries. Um, berries is considered, uh, one serving of berries is considered one cup of berries. And berries could range from acai berries, blackberries, blueberries, cranberries, raspberries, strawberries. And like I said before, there's a lot of research on strawberries and blueberries out there for cognition. Um, so if you eat a serving, two or more servings a week of berries, give yourself one point. If you eat one serving a week, give yourself a half a point. And if you eat less than one serving a week, give yourself zero points. And like I said before, this is where the mind diet differs from the Mediterranean and the DASH diet. It really focuses on berries, not just fruit in general. Nuts. So a serving of nuts is one ounce or a small handful. Um, if you eat almonds, Brazil nuts, cashews, macadamia nuts, peanuts, peanut butter even counts, or almond butter, pecans, pistachios, walnuts. If you eat any nuts, um, if you eat five or more servings a week, give yourself one point. This is where it stretches on this half a point area. If you eat one serving a month to less than five servings a week, give yourself a half a point. And if you eat less than one serving a month, give yourself zero points. Here is olive oil. If olive oil, oil is your primary source of oil, give yourself one point. If it is not your primary source of oil, give yourself zero points. Whole grains. So, a serving of whole grains is a half a cup of cooked grain. So it could be brown rice or oatmeal, uh, the hot oatmeal that could be, that can count, or a slice, one slice of whole wheat bread or whole grain bread, and it needs to be a hundred percent. If you eat whole grains three or more times a day, give yourself one point. If you eat it. Uh, one to two servings a day, give yourself a half a point. And if you eat it less than one time, one serving a day, give yourself zero points. Fish, not fried. I put not fried on there because I know some people like their fish and chips and that doesn't count. Um, so a serving of fish would be three to five ounce serving. And fish can range from herring, lake, tra lake trout, mackerel, salmon, sardines, scallops, sea bass, shrimp, squid, or tuna. And it can even be canned tuna. Um, if you eat fish one or more meals a week, give yourself one point. If you eat it from one to th uh, three servings uh, a month, give yourself half a point. And if you rarely eat fish, give yourself zero points. Beans and legumes. Um, a serving of beans and legumes is a half a cup. Um, and it can range from lentils to black beans to chickpeas to kidney beans, pinto beans, white beans. If you eat a half a cup uh, of beans or legumes, or um, if you eat more than three servings a week, give yourself one point. If you eat one to three servings a week, give yourself a half a point. And if you eat it less than one time a week, give yourself zero points. So remember, if you eat, if you like your bean and cheese burritos, give yourself your points. So 
poultry, not fried as well. And this uh, chicken looks beautiful. It's a rotisserie chicken. It's not fried. So just a disclaimer. So it's not, a, if you eat poultry, not fried. Um, if you eat one serving, uh, a serving is three to five ounces. If you eat poultry two or more times a week, give yourself one point. If you eat one serving a week, give yourself a half a point. And if you eat less than one serving, give yourself zero points. And here is wine. Um, and it can be any kind of wine. It doesn't have to be specifically red wine. Um, wine helps with, with blood flow. So that's the nice part. You can, if you'd like white wine instead of red wine, you don't have to switch, but it is one five ounce glass of wine, but red wine is better, I, I believe. But, uh, if you eat what, or if you drink one glass of wine a day, give yourself one point. If this is another stretch, I think, but if you drink one glass of wine once a month to six times a week, give yourself a half a point. And if you drink wine hardly ever or never, give yourself zero points. Now here we're into the brainless food. So we only have five more foods to go through. Um, so if you eat butter or margarine, um, a serving is considered one tablespoon or one pat of butter. If you eat less than one tablespoon a day, give yourself one point. Now really think about it because it's what you cook with and what you put on your pancakes if you eat pancakes for breakfast or toast. So really think about how much uh, butter or margarine you do use. Um, if you eat one to two tablespoons a day, give yourself a half a point. And if you eat more than two tablespoons a day, give yourself zero points. Cheese. Now this is really whole fat cheese. So if you buy the lower fat or the non-fat cheese, um, I don't know if I've seen non-fat cheese, but if you do buy that, um, you might need to adjust your, your points a little bit. But for whole fat cheese, a serving is one to two ounces. And one, a one ounce serving of hard cheese is about the size of your thumb or uh, two tablespoons of crumbled cheese. So if you eat cheese less than one serving a week, give yourself one point. This is where I struggle. That's why I was kind of shocked at, that it said a week. If you eat one to six servings a week, give yourself a half a point. And if you eat uh, whole fat cheese, seven or more servings um, a week, give yourself zero points. I will say this, that there is no direct research on the effects of dairy on brain and dementia risk. However, because dairy products can be a significant source of saturated fat, is, is, it is recommended to use the lower fat version. So if you, if you do drink milk, try low fat or non-fat milk and the low fat or non-fat yogurts. But one thing to be aware of is if you're making that switch, when they take, when a lot of food companies take things out, they add things. So they might add extra sugar to make sure that it tastes well, or they might add sodium. So make, take a look at your food labels. Um, for red meat, um, red meat, you want to think about everything you eat throughout the day. So even your breakfast sausage or your bacon, this all counts. A serving of red meat is three to five ounces. Um, and the big concern with red meat is the saturated fats as well. So if you eat less than four servings a week of red meat, give yourself one point. If you eat four to six servings a week, give yourself a half a point. And if you eat seven or more servings a week, give yourself zero points. Um, and I'm just going to add some tidbit of information here. Uh, because saturated fat is the big concern here, you can eliminate some saturated fat by choosing the leanest cuts of meat, um, using cooking racks or dripping trays to eliminate fat drippings. And before you cook your meat, 
trimming off the fat that you, the visible fat. And then again, after you cook it and you see fat cutting that off too. Um, here's another little bit of information. Um, the heart healthy diet suggests that you limit the amount of red meat you eat. So it's based on this that uh, the mind diet felt like suggesting limiting red meat consumption to protect your brain. Currently, there is limited research on how eating meat affects brain. There is indirect evidence, however, through the positive benefits of cognitive decline and dementia risk with higher adherence to the DASH and the Mediterranean diets, given that both diets limit red meat. Fast and fried foods, I mean, this seems like a given to me. Um, if you eat less than one serving a week, give yourself one point. If you eat one to three servings a week, give yourself a half a point. And if you eat fast or fried foods, and even if you fry foods at home, you should include it in this. If you eat it four or more times a week, give yourself zero points. Pastries and sweets. Um, if so pastries and sweets can be from your desserts at night to your donuts for breakfast. Um, really think about what you eat at home. Um, if you eat less than five servings a week, give yourself one point. If you eat one to, or five to six servings a week, give yourself a half a point. And if you eat more than seven servings a week, give yourself zero points. And again, there is no scientific research on how pastries and sugary foods affect your cognitive health and no direct evidence uh, to recommend that you remove them from your diet to protect against cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease. However, there is plenty of reasons to limit them in your diet to less, to five, less than five servings a week. Okay, so now we are done with the point system. So I'm gonna encourage you all to add up your points and, and then you'll determine your mind diet score right now. So what your point system, what it means is if you scored an eight and a half or above, like this is what the, the, um, the research showed that if you scored eight and a half to 12 and a half, you were 53% lower risk of developing Alzheimer's. And if you were in that intermediate range of seven to eight, you are 35% lower risk of developing Alzheimer's. So after determining your mind diet score, you know what you can and can work on and what you don't have to work on. Um, one thing I wanna show you is that from uh, the US News and World Report, the mind diet was ranked number four in best diets overall. It was number four or number 34 in best fast weight loss diet, number 28 in best weight loss diets. So I just want to show you because uh, the first, the one I just said was fast weight loss diet, and this one is just best weight loss diets. Um, number seven in best heart healthy diets, number five in best diabetes diets, number four in best diets for healthy eating, and number three in easiest diets to follow. Following a diet that is based on scientifically driven dietary recommendations is one of the most assured ways you can keep your brain functioning at its best. So remember, it's not just diet, it's also your lifestyle. Um, so lifestyle has an impact on uh, your cognitive health as well. So make sure you exercise, that you get sufficient sleep, that you manage your stress, and that you do develop those meaningful relationships. And that is another part of the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet really is a focus of lifestyle. It's not just what you eat. Um, if you have any questions of what kind of exercise you should be doing, you can ask your doctor, you can see a personal trainer, you could go to a physical therapist if you have any sort of limitations. Um, making sure you do get a sufficient amount of sleep can help with managing your stress. So they're all, uh, they all overlap. It's all important and it's all part of a healthy lifestyle. 
Um, in conclusion, diet does affect biological mechanisms such as oxidative stress and inflammation that underline Alzheimer's. Diet can work indirectly by affecting other Alzheimer's risk factors such as diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. Um, so what we learned tonight, you learned the definition of Alzheimer's, you know where the MIND diet originated from, you now have your MIND diet score, and you know what foods you should eat and what foods you should limit. And I like the word limit instead of avoid because everyone should have birthday cake on their birthday if they want to. Um, there is no bad foods, it's just eating more of the good foods, or the healthy foods, I should say, not good foods. Um, so let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. Is there any questions? I think, I, are you there? Sorry about that. Um, oh, yes, no worries. I have a couple of questions. And just as a reminder, um, you can ask in the Q and A box at the bottom, but we do have a couple that have come through. So the first one was with strawberries. I've read that they have the highest rate of pesticides, even if they are considered organic due to contamination, does that affect their effects on the brain? Um, no, because of the pesticides are really regulated. So no, they don't. And with the research, they're using California grown strawberries. They're not using organic strawberries either. So no, with the research that they've used in um, the mine diet, they had no, there was no adverse effect with the pesticides. Great. Um, and there was a question about the serving amount for sweets. It sounds like this person, I don't know if you had oh, okay. or <laughs> I, I had a feeling that was going to come up. So really, I would think about it's if you eat sweets in general and you typically tend to eat them every day, then then you would give yourself zero points. If you really limit yourself to like three or four sweets uh, a week, then you would probably give yourself the one point. But for serving size, there was no specific serving size that was mentioned. Got it. And so for someone that may have gotten a low score, do you have recommendations for how they can improve that for the sake of their, their memory? Definitely. So I think that the key is starting off slow. If we make drastic changes at the very beginning, it's very hard to stick to it. So making little steps makes the big difference. Um, for instance, if you only eat, if you eat cheese seven meals a day or seven meals a week, restricting yourself to eating it uh, five or six meals, even that little change can make a big difference. And then you'll start to notice that, oh, wow, I don't really need cheese in my diet. And you can cut it back even further. Um, same with incorporating berries instead of taking something away, uh, actually buying the berries and putting them in your cart and taking them home and cleaning them and having them ready to eat in the refrigerator is a good way that you're going to eat them instead of saying, oh yeah, I have to do that, but never buying them. It's putting the wheels in motion. So just the little things make the big difference. Great. And then going back to sugar, um, what do you suggest for sugar cravings? What sugar substitute is better? Um, okay. As far as sugar substitutes, I would recommend trying to take the sweets and there is sugar in fruit and really eating fruit would be probably your best, but um, you can always go with Splenda or I don't even know what the other sugar substitutes are. They're all safe, but um, really getting it from fruit would be the best way. And then you're also killing two birds with one stone. You get to get your berries in and you get to cut back on the sweets. Do you suggest um, agave syrup or honey as a, a natural sweetener? How does that work? Yeah, that can work too. That definitely can work. But it depend. you would want to limit how much you have because everything within moderation, if you're pouring honey all over everything, that's not going to be very, very beneficial. But um, you can definitely use it for a sweetener. That's not a problem. 
And um, there's a question about frozen berries and vegetables. Um, are those okay versus fresh? Oh, I'm so happy that question came up. Um, yes. So frozen food, or frozen berries and vegetables are wonderful. Um, in fact, sometimes they hold more nutrients than those that are sitting on the grocery store shelves for a couple of days. So they are great to eat and they're very convenient. They're how most of them are already clean. So you don't have to deal with that step. Um, it's just pulling them out of the freezer. So yes, they're a great way to get uh, your veggies and your fruit. And they're, le and they're less expensive, I believe. Great. Um, we've gotten quite a few questions just asking about where people can find more information about this. Is Are there websites or books or printed materials that you recommend? Um, so, and, and, and as you're thinking about that, um, you're welcome to email or respond to the email that you got the email confirmation from for the Zoom. I'm happy to help connect the dots on some of those or get those resources from Becky. So um, I just wanted to throw that out there as an option as well. Yes, and I can, and I will send you some um, links and everything like that. But the one that I, I read, um, this is the book that Dr. Morris wrote. I don't know if you can see it, but um, Diet for the Mind. There are some cookbooks but from registered dietitians that you can just pull up on Amazon that um, have recipes. Um, in this book, half of it is recipes from her daughter who was a chef. Um, I found the recipes to be very complex because I am a simple cook and I like five ingredients or less. And a lot of these, there was a lot of ingredients. So probably with the registered dietitian, it might be easier because she'll probably have less ingredients in recipes. Um, but there was that book that I used for reference. I used the National Institute of Health. Um, I used Alzheimer's, um, the Alzheimer's Association. And actually I have my list of references on here too. Um, and uh, so I, and I use alzheimers.org, but uh, even, I, I can send you some links as well, Natasha, and then you can get them out. Because I think doing a Google search, you might end up with a lot of not accurate information. Great. Yeah, I'm happy to help disseminate that. So um, for those that registered, I would imagine most of you, if not all of you, um, got an email confirmation or an email reminder from, from me for this webinar. You can just reply to that and request that information and can send that to you. Um, we also did record this webinar, so it'll be on our YouTube channel um, tonight, if not tomorrow, you know, tomorrow morning at the latest. Um, and I don't see any other questions, but by all means, please ask if, if anything else is on top of your mind. Um, just wanted to remind folks that, yeah, this, you can reference this YouTube, um, on YouTube, or if you have Facebook, it'll be on our Facebook feed. Um, and it looks like, yes, people are asking their very interested in getting um, a list of the food category, serving sizes, quantity. Definitely. So like I said, well, um, if you can just respond that to that email, I can make sure to get that out to, to those yes. of you that are interested. And I think I'll just start to wrap it up unless I see any other last questions come through, but there is um, a survey. Oh, sorry. I'm going to stop right there. There's a question about coffee. How does coffee work with this? Okay, so with coffee, and I'm, I'm assuming someone's thinking chocolate too out there, um, with coffee and chocolate, the, the reason why they were not incorporated into the mind diet is because there's not as much, there's not as much scientific evidence for her and the research team to put it into um, the dietary recommendations. There is positive benefit with eating dark chocolate and with uh, drinking coffee. Um, in fact, studies do show that you're more um, uh, you're more uh, present and involved when you drink a cup of coffee than if you refrain completely. But um, they just didn't have the research there to put it into the diet for dietary recommendations. Great. Well, thank you again so much. Thanks for um, the thoughtful questions and for all of this amazing um, 
research that you've brought forward today. Um, there will be a quick survey at the conclusion of this webinar. So that is a great opportunity to let us know how we did tonight. And then if you have future topics you would like to hear, we, we love to hear um, what you'd be interested in in the future. And it looks like we'll just give you back eight minutes um, of your night. So thank you, Becky, so much for the informative webinar. And I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. All right, thank you.